The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are... Good morning, everybody, now. and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Cheryl, and I'm joined today by Gino, and we have a special guest, Michael Pedersen, joining us today, and we're going to talk all about maximizing gain before feedback. We have done this presentation before, but it's always such important information, and we always get such a nice response, so I want to make sure we're continuing to get the word out. But before we dive into that, just a few items of housekeeping. First of all, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available probably sometime early next week on our website. If you go to sure.com slash training, the webinar archives are located there. You'll be able to find this one, as well as all of our past webinars. Um, there's a lot of great information there, so if you're looking to expand your knowledge about any of our products or, or some audio um, information, it is a great place to just learn a lot of great stuff. So sure.com slash training. You can also subscribe, I believe, to a newsletter, so you'll get updates about our upcoming webinars and know what's coming up next. We do about one a month. So lots of good information there. Um, second of all, as we go through the session today, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the question pane. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the session. Um, if you cannot see the question pane, just look to the right-hand side of your screen for a little box with an orange orange button and a white arrow in it. Just click on that and that will maximize your little navigation pane there and you can ask any questions using that. So I believe that about wraps up all of the housekeeping notes. Let's get into the bulk of this. Take it away, Gino. Okay, thanks Cheryl and thanks Michael for joining us once again. You're welcome. Uh, as Cheryl mentioned, we've we've done this topic before and we're doing it again because it always proves to be a very popular one. And as um, as, as we've noted uh, in the past, you know, this is probably one of the more frequently asked questions that we in, encounter here on the support end of things at Sure. Um, it's a, it's it's something that everyone has uh, encountered probably if you use microphones or or even have been to an event that involves microphone, you've experienced feedback, and everyone kind of gets how annoying it is. And there's often a lot of uh, mythology and misunderstanding around. Um, how much uh, about what causes it and and what are the things you can do to try and uh, try and prevent it. So we'll do you know a little bit of myth busting today and a lot of practical information or tips that you can use to try and uh, you know get uh, get your sound system up and running with a minimum of uh, interruption from the annoying sound of feedback. So it's probably worth before we get into the specifics, describing what exactly feedback is, because uh, a lot of times uh, we'll get calls from people who are complaining about feedback, but it's actually not even feedback. Buzz, hum, they always say, you know, dropouts with wireless, they call it feedback. So we never know exactly kind of what they're talking about. Right. But it, it once you learn what it is, it's pretty distinctive. It is, it is a, usually depending on the frequency at which the feedback is occurring, it's a squealing or a howling, uh, some sort of a, a sustained ringing uh, oscillation uh, that happens um, due to the interaction of multiple uh, parts of the sound system. Um, so the microphone always gets blamed. Well, and that's why we're the ones doing this webinar, right? Because <laughs> when someone hears feedback in a sound system, they uh, automatically assume it is the microphone's fault and, and, and call us or send us an email wanting to know why they this microphone they bought has feedback in it. Right. Uh, but what really happens here again it's it's a, an acoustic phenomenon caused by the interaction of all these components in the sound system so in other words sound goes into the microphone right talker or whatever the sound source happens to be which goes you know usually to the mixer to amplify the rest of the components in the sound system to make that uh, original input source louder once it comes out of the loudspeaker. And that source, that signal comes out of the loudspeaker and then it gets picked up by the microphone again, forming a loop. And that loop of pickup is, is what is what the cause of feedback is. So, you know, the microphone is is one element of the signal path, and if you unplug the microphone, feedback goes away. But if you unplug the loudspeaker, the feedback also or goes away. Or turn off the amplifier. Turn off the, any any of those if any of those components are removed from the chain, then the, uh, the 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 feedback goes away. But people, you know, how many times have you watched a movie, right? Any any movie that has a, a microphone shown in it for part of a performance or anything, what's the the one clue that the the sound editor always puts in to let you know that the microphone is on? <laughs> Yep. Somebody taps the microphone and it starts squealing. That's how you know it's on. Otherwise, right. how would you know it's on? Yep. Um, so that, uh, that that's kind of where that comes from. But um, really what we want to talk about is, so when will feedback occur? Obviously, it doesn't occur uh, all the time. So we, we, Michael, 
tell us. It's very simple. When the sound level of the loudspeaker is greater than the sound level from the talker or performer, we're going to use talker throughout it because it's easier, at the microphone diaphragm, feedback happens. So the, the directionality of the microphone does come into effect somewhat, but we're just trying to keep this very simple. So sound level of the loudspeaker greater than the sound level of the talker at the mic, you're going to have a feedback loop. So you can imagine the scenarios where this is probably a worst case uh, situation. Walking in front of the loudspeaker with walking, your microphone. Walking in front of the loudspeaker. Uh, or think about a stage monitor situation, right, where you've got a, a loudspeaker that is fairly close to the microphone because it has to be close to the performer, and you have to get it, it loud enough at the performer's ear, which is very close to the microphone, which is very likely going to result in the loudspeaker often being long, louder than the sound of the singer that you're trying to amplify right. anyway. So. In that case, of course, the directionality of the microphone does make a difference. But when we get into this later, we're going to kind of assume non-directional microphones because it's just a better way to look at this. So what is gain before feedback then? What, what does that term mean? Basically, what it means is how loud can I turn it up before feedback starts to occur. And so that's that's what we're going to be looking at here when we say maximizing gain before feedback is is optimizing your sound system such that you can get the maximum amount of gain before feedback or try to get it as loud as possible before feedback will occur. So how do you improve this? Uh, well, there are several different things we're going to look at here in, in during the webinar that can help you improve the situation. Um, the first one we're going to look at is an equation referred to as the potential acoustic gain equation. And I know it's, it's kind of early on a Monday morning for math, but uh, we'll try to keep it really more conceptual at this point. But it is mathematically possible to figure out at what point uh, the sound system is going to feed back and, and determine if that is enough signal level. Yeah, it's, it's a rough rule of thumb, but it's certainly something that everyone should do before you even try to sit down and design a system or set up a system. And then we'll look at how utilizing directional components can help maximize gain before <clears throat> feedback because the, the equation we're going to talk about assumes sort of omnidirectional components, so it's kind of a worst case scenario, but employing directional mics and directional loudspeakers can help. And then we'll get into utilizing equalization and feedback reducers, DSP, things like that that can, um, that can sort of uh, help you with that. So first of all, we're going to look at potential acoustic gain. And we're actually going to start with, whoop, ah, didn't mean to go that far yet. Uh, we want to do a, a little poll yet. Uh, hopefully you didn't uh, see, the see, answers. The answers. <laughs> see the answer there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch this poll, um, which is trying to figure out what is the major factor in determining gain before feedback. Um, you can select uh, one of the answers there. Uh, we kind of want to see what, uh, what people are thinking or what people think is the major factor in determining gain, gain before feedback. And we're getting pretty close to see we've got twenty two percent voted. See, everybody everybody saw the answer already. We or, gave it or, away. Or they're PowerPoint smart and they know what the answer is. Well, that's true. <laughs> You're right. Thank you for being the optimist. Um Again, your choices, of course, are wattage to the power amplifier, component to component distance, how much equalization, or the type of microphone that you use. And uh, right now, we're seeing uh, 71, 70% 70 think it has to do with the distance between the uh, components. A uh, distant second at 21% is the type of microphone. Yeah, the, the, our marketing department likes to see that. Yeah, exactly. By, by this microphone. By this microphone, the one, there won't be any feedback. The one that doesn't have any feedback in it. Ooh, All right, yeah. we're, at, we're at a minute here, so I'm going to close the poll down. Okay. Uh, we, can, we, can, we, can see, we can see the responses there. And as most people guess, yes, it is distance. Distance between components is the major factor in uh, what determines uh, what, what, uh, when you're going to experience feedback in a sound system, right? But again, don't just take our word for it. We can uh, use use math to, to figure this out. Um, so there's a couple of things that you need to do when you're going to calculate potential acoustic gain. And one of the most important is um, figuring out needed acoustic gain. Um, so potential acoustic gain is a number that will tell you how much, uh, how loud you can turn it up before it's going to feed back. But you also need to know whether or not that's loud enough. Yeah. So you really compare both numbers. You know, Gene and I were sitting about two feet apart or maybe three feet. So just normal conversation level, we can hear each other quite fine acoustically. Now, if this room was big enough and we could move Gino 35 feet apart from me, he wouldn't be hearing me as loud just because of the inverse square law. So the idea about needed acoustical gain is for Gino to hear me like we were seated two feet apart. 
what's how much gain do we have to add? So that's what the needed acoustical gain is. The idea is to bring everybody in the room within, let's say, three feet of the talker. So let's look at that. Let's see how you calculate needed acoustic gain, something you would use a scientific calculator for because you notice that there's logarithms in there. But um, there's really two factors that we're concerned with, um, D sub ref, which is your reference level, and D sub far, which is how loud do you want the signal level to be at the furthest talker. So uh, you pick some arbitrary reference, I guess, in this case, we're using like a choir as an example, I guess. So uh, the idea here is we want the listener in the back row of the audience to hear at the same level as the choir director who's standing, you know, in this case, we'll say six feet away from the choir. So the choir director six feet back, the furthest um, listener is 33 feet back. So you plug all that into the equation and what you end up with, with is a needed acoustic gain of approximately 15 dB. That's how much gain we need to get from our sound system so that the furthest listener Here's the same as the reference. So turn the sound system off, <clears throat> turn the sound system on. It should be at least 15 dB louder with the sound system on for the people in the far back row to hear what the level that the sound the choir director is. So now we have to calculate potential acoustic gain based on, you guessed it, distances between all of these different um, components and talkers or performers here to see if we have enough acoustic trying, gain. Trying to get 15 dB at least. So if you want to look at the distance from the microphone to the source, which is D sub S, the distance between the microphone and the loudspeaker, D sub 1, the distance between the loudspeaker and the furthest listener, which is D sub 2, and the distance between the source and the furthest listener, which is D sub 0. Right. And some people say, why do you include D sub 0? It's because acoustically, some of that sound is going to reach those listeners acoustic in the, through, the, through the air. So you have to consider that as part of the equation. So you plug all those numbers in along with a few additional factors. Uh, one is the number of open microphones. That's what NOM stands for. So you put in the, the, the 10 log NOM uh, element here to consider the number of open microphones. Because guess what? The more open microphones you have in the system, the more likely it is it's a minus, have feedback. It's a minus. It takes away from the amount of gain you can get, not adds to it. Right. Fewer number, fewer number of microphones is better. And basically because as you add more microphones, it's more feedback paths. That's true. More chances for the microphones to hear that sound from the loudspeaker. And then we put in FSM, which stands for feedback stability margin. You, you don't want to be running kind of right at the edge where feedback might just occur because you're kind of balanced at the pinnacle starts there. Starts to so, ring. And it, yeah, the system starts <clears throat> to ring. So you put in usually a 6 dB uh, feedback stability margin. So we'll throw some numbers in here just to kind of see what it ends up looking like. And where we end up in this particular situation is 8.8 .8 dB of potential acoustic mm, not gain. enough. At the top, NAG was 15. So that means that by the time we try to turn this sound system up to the point where that furthest listener hears as well as our reference did, the systems, you're already like 6 dB off here. So you're well, in, well into feedback at this point. So that wouldn't be enough. So... How can we fix it? Well, we could add another second loudspeaker closer to that furthest listener, and then that, sh that makes uh, D sub 2 much smaller, and that would, in fact, get us where we need to be. But that's the expense of another loudspeaker and power amplifier and climbing up there and hanging it and running all the cables right, right, and all of that other up. business. So that certainly shortens up that distance and, and makes it work. It may not be the most inexpensive way to do it. What's the most inexpensive way to increase your potential acoustic gain? Move the microphone closer to the sound source. That is the number one thing. A lot of people sort of know this intuitively, but this kind of proves it mathematically as well. By changing the microphone to source distance from six feet to three feet, our potential acoustic gain has increased 15 to 15.3 dB, about a 6 dB increase there by having the distance between the microphone and the sound source, and now we're exactly where we need to be. We didn't have to buy anything else. We didn't have to hang another loudspeaker. So all we had to do was move the microphone closer to the sound source, right? Um, and if anyone has ever, uh, you know, been at a wedding and seen the best man making a toast and he holds the microphone down by his belly button and no one can hear him, uh, and then the, 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 the DJ tries to turn up the, the microphone so that you can hear him and it goes into feedback and that's not pleasant, um, the easiest thing you can do is say, hey, hold the microphone up near your mouth. And then what do you know? It's loud enough and it's not feeding back anymore. 
could add a second microphone. What happens if we add a second microphone instead of moving oh, the first you'll, microphone you'll, you'll, closer? It'll be much better. Will that be? Will that be much better? No, that's oh, actually no. worse. We are now uh, with 3 dB worse than we were before, actually, just by adding a second microphone. So, again, as much as we would like you to buy more microphones, uh, it's not necessarily going to improve your gain before feedback situation. So, again, moving the microphone uh, or the loudspeaker uh, is probably the most helpful ways to do it. Again, as it says here, audible improvements require distances to be doubled or halved. That's, that's really important. So don't think if your loudspeaker, let's say, is um, 20 feet away from the listeners, you can move it to 18 feet and it's going to make much of a difference. It always has to be doubled or half. That's why the microphone is so easy because from 12 inches to 6 inches is easy. From 6 inches to 3 inches is easy. Uh, it's not so easy when you're taking a loudspeaker that's 100 feet away and you got to move it 50 feet or 25 feet and so forth. So keep in mind, you have to half or double these things to make an audible difference. Mm -hmm. And then as it says here, again, limiting the number of open microphones is another good way to help improve potential acoustic gain. Because again, as every time the number of open microphones doubles, that brings you 3 dB closer to the the point of feedback. Just like, just like turning up the master volume control on, on the mixer. Right. Uh, so... Obviously, in, in many situations, you know, it's not practical to only use one microphone, um, but there are uh, devices that you can use to essentially keep the uh, gain of the system equal to what one microphone would be. Uh, one way you can do that is automatic microphone mixers, which I'll actually, I'll, I'll, I'll let Michael talk about this since he's got quite a history here with automatic microphone mixers at Sure. So what an automatic microphone mixer basically does. First of all, let's talk about this. These are really not, in general, applicable for music. These are designed from the beginning to be used for speech. So we're using one here now because there's three microphones in the room, um, city council, chambers, um, legislatures. That's what they're really used for. So the idea is that an automatic mixer is like the world's fastest sound engineer. It keeps all the microphones off. It turns them on when someone speaks within several thousandths of a second, keeps them on while the person speaks, and then turns them off when they're speaking. In a church application, they're fine for any applications which are actual speech, but don't use them for music because they just don't react well in general to music. So they eliminate the number of open microphones factor by always keeping the output essentially equivalent to one microphone. So if you have one microphone on, you have an output level of X. If you have two microphones on, it lowers the output level slightly to keep it the same. So basically an automatic mixer keeps the output level equivalent to one microphone. By having fewer microphones on at this time, it also reduces background noise and reverberation. That really applies more for broadcasting, or if you're, you know, if you're sending out your signal or recording the signal, it'd be useful for that. And it also prevents comb filtering because comb filtering happens when you have multiple microphones picking up the same sound from the same talker. And eventually, when you have too many microphones, I will do my imitation of, of comb filtering, which kind of starts to sound like this. <laughs> so by using an automatic mixer, you get rid of all of these things. And they are quite um, quite functional and quite invisible in use as far as you don't hear them in use. So again, I think Michael already covered this again, uh, what is an automatic mixer and the benefits of it. This is the closest we'll get to a commercial during this webinar, but just sure, obviously, uh, manufactures some uh, automatic microphone mixers, the SCM820, which is what you're actually listening to this webinar on with three microphones being automixed through an SCM820 here um, is, uh, is one um, potential solution that has a lot of applications. Uh, but again, in the context of what we're talking about today, um, it's, it's useful in how it eliminates the number of open microphone factors. So it is a tool that can be employed um, to, to maximize your gain before feedback. Um, and Sure's approach to um, automatic mixing is something that we call uh, IntelliMix, which I think is kind of worth reviewing just sort of what makes IntelliMix a little bit different um, and than other automatic mixers out there and kind of a little bit about how it works here. Um, so obviously, in, 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 when you have an automatic mixer, you need, you need to have a sound source here. Oh, look, oh there's my, a sound oh, there source. What a handsome looking guy that is. He is handsome. Um, and then, uh, so, but basically what happens is when you have this, uh, the automatic mixer, the way it works with IntelliMix is it uses something that we call noise adaptive threshold gating. So it's not uh, like a typical sort of noise gate where you have to manually set a threshold uh, based on where you think it should be on, on the noise conditions in the room. But the IntelliMix circuitry is actually able to um, 
to d to listen on a per channel basis to the ambient noise in the room and automatically set its threshold. And as the ambient or background noise level changes, the mixer can automatically adjust its threshold to keep those microphones turned off. Let, yeah, let's define auto ambient noise in this case. It has to be constant in amplitude and constant in frequency. So for example, this, this, this would be ambient noise, Shh, like this. This would not because that changes in amplitude and frequency. So I can't tell the difference between that because my, the clicking of the tongue could be speech. Right. And since the, the mixer is able to sort of uh, determine the, the difference between very uh, ambient noise, the very limited dynamic range versus speech, which is very dynamic, the speech really only has to be just a couple of dB louder than the ambient noise, and the mixer is able to gate that microphone channel on very quickly. Uh, it's less than half of a millisecond, so you don't ever have speech getting clipped off or missing parts of anything. It, happen, it happens very quickly, faster than a human sound engineer could possibly do it. And again, very reliably, because it, it can sort of tell the difference between ambient noise and, uh, and, and the direct sound of the speech. Also, why music is not good for it, because someone could sing a note and hold it consistently, and that would be constant in amplitude and frequency. And so, though it may gate on originally for it, after a while, it would consider that ambient noise and turn the microphone off. So, again, not useful for music. Yeah, definitely for speech, though. Um, so, that's, uh, that's a little bit about how uh, in, in the IntelliMix works, just for sort of background information. Uh, but let's let's go now into uh, other ways to control feedback besides uh, potential acoustic gain and using an automatic mixer to keep your NOM equal to one. First, we're gonna look at directional components. First with directional microphones. I think that is probably, mm, it, it probably fights with the using equalization as the number one or number two thing in most people's minds when they're trying to control feedback, right? Um, the, the, omnidirect the poor omnidirectional microphone gets a bit of a bad rap because a lot of people just assume that, you know, oh, if I'm getting feedback with my omnidirectional microphone, I should just go to a cardioid and, and things will get things will get much better. Um, and I mean, logically, that sort of makes sense because again, if we think that, okay, well, feedback is caused when you know the microphone hears the loudspeaker again, and if the microphone is sensitive to sound from all directions, that increases the likelihood that it's gonna hear that loudspeaker. But the distance still is the major, most important factor. If you look at a lot of, uh, go to a lot of you know Broadway theater type applications. Uh, they're using omnidirectional lavalier microphones, and they're not having feedback problems. And that's because the microphones are always usually somewhere on the head, taped to the side of the face, the forehead for the wig, somewhere close to the mouth. D sub S is short. D sub S is short, right? Where you run into more problems with omnidirectional lavalier mics is when it's clipped to the tie somewhere down the middle of your chest. It's a little bit further away, often double the distance, and then you're more likely to get feedback in that position. And let's, let's look at these patterns. Let's just look at the first three of omnicardioid and supercardioid and imagine you're in a room where you have overhead loudspeakers so that the loudspeaker is firing directly down into the microphone. You can see that the omni looking upwards and the cardioid looking upward and the supercardioid looking upward are all going to react the same. There is no advantage when the loudspeaker is overhead firing down right to the front of those microphones because they're all have the same directionality looking upward. So when you're so one thing to always keep in mind when you're considering directional patterns is that uh, you also have to consider the placement of the different components such that you can take advantage of the directional pattern. Now, cardioid and supercardioid mics are you know less sensitive overall to ambient sound, but again, if the microphone is facing directly into a loudspeaker the pattern isn't really going to help you very much. So it all becomes about distance. And this is why we are big advocates of uh, using ear-worn, ear-set microphones or headset microphones in place of lavalier microphones for many speech applications, particularly House of Worship. We get a lot of you know, people who are concerned because they're getting you know, feedback from the pastor's lavalier microphone. And it's like, go to an ear set. A yeah, little historical aspect. Lavalier microphones were brought out for broadcasters. And in a broadcast situation, when there is a newscaster sitting there with a microphone on, on his or her chest, it's not being fed back into the room. It's being fed to your TV set at home. There is no feedback path. And then eventually people say, oh, wouldn't they look great? It work great for sound reinforcement? Well, not really. <laughs> because D sub S because is D sub large. S is large. Right, exactly. which you're trying, trying to minimize. But again... But it can help in a situation where you know you've gotten D sub S as small as you can, and you're still not quite where you need to be. Then going to a directional pattern does give you a few dB of additional benefit. 
But again, as we mentioned, loudspeaker placement is important. This is something you sometimes run into when, uh, particularly in live uh, sound reinforcement, music reinforcement scenarios where uh, you've got stage monitors. The supercardioid pattern is typically thought of as, as having better gain before feedback than the cardioid pattern, which is which is generally true. It is slightly better. But the loudspeakers, again, have to be placed properly because you'll notice that the supercardioid pattern, although uh, has offers greater rejection at the sides than cardioid, has uh, this small lobe uh, rear of rear pickup directly behind the microphone. So if you leave your loudspeaker as you would with a cardioid mic, right, blowing directly into the back of the microphone, you might actually get a little bit more feedback than you would with a cardioid pattern. But if you move the, the loudspeaker, stage monitor loudspeaker off to the side at about 120 degrees off axis from the front of the mic, then it's actually much better, uh, well, I should say better than a cardioid pattern microphone in terms of gain before feedback. So you always, again, you always have to consider the pattern characteristics when you're trying to use yeah. the directional pattern to maximize your gain. And where's the sound source you're trying to reject? Now, again, directional loudspeakers can also be em employed to a certain extent. Not all loudspeakers are, well, very few are actually truly omnidirectional. But again, you have to consider um, uh, the, the frequency of the feedback you're trying to minimize. Um, in, a, in a directional loudspeaker, the high frequency drivers and the horns uh, are able to kind of control the, the pattern and be more directional versus lower frequencies emanating from loudspeakers tend to be much more omnidirectional. So there's not a whole lot you can do there to to help. But again, what it really comes down to is, you know, how are you pointing the device? So in this case, um, you know, you're standing maybe slightly in front of the loudspeaker and the high frequencies are going directly into the microphone. Guess what? That's a feedback path. But sometimes you can just move the microphone so that it is, you know, out of the direct line of fire of the horn from the loudspeaker and that will help. Or you just angle the loudspeaker differently. And again, it's all about trying to, to eliminate that path that acoustic path from the loudspeaker back into the microphone again. So all directional components can help. You just have to make sure you're you're aiming them the right way to take advantage of that. And let's just go back just for a second. And just there are some amazing advances in line arrays, um, particularly for speech applications, very long and tall, skinny microphones that basically throw out for lack of a better term, a pancake of sound. Yeah. They can be very useful because they tend to focus the sound into the audience area and perhaps away from the presenting area. So those can help a great deal, but they are not cheap and they do have to be set up properly. Correct. Yeah, they're not something you can walk down to your local music store and walk out with. No. <laughs> And now we come to equalization. This is often the first thing that people reach for when they, when they have a feedback issue. Um, and I guess maybe because it's an immediate thing that you can that you can go to. But again, it's actually a little bit further down in the pecking order of things you should try in order to maximize your game before feedback. But why why is it effective or why why would you do this? Well, if you measure the output of a sound system in a given room, you, you, you would notice that it's often far from flat. In fact, what you're, what you're seeing here, so this kind of measured response of some arbitrary sound system somewhere has lots of peaks and valleys in it in terms of the frequency response. So what, what that means then is as you try to increase the gain or the level in your sound system, certain frequencies the ones that are peaks here, are going to start to ring or feedback before other frequencies do. So to the extent that you can um, flatten the response of your sound system by reducing these peaks will uh, offer you, again, a few dB extra gain before feedback, right? So you're trying to make the sound system as linear as possible. So when you go in and you use equalization or you're grabbing the EQ to because feedback is occurring, you're trying to find out, okay, what frequencies are feeding back first? Let's see if we can um, reduce those. Uh, a very common tool for doing using this is the graphic equalizer because you've basically got, you know, if it's a third octave graphic equalizer, you've got 31 bands that you can go to, 31 faders essentially you can get to very easily to grab a frequency and, and try and reduce it to get rid of that feedback. The problem with the graphic equalizer is that it only has those 31 frequencies that you can get to directly. And if the frequency you're trying to get to is in between two of the frequencies that are available on the graphic, then you either have to cut more than you would like or cut two frequencies to get to the frequency. And then the fact that the width or the Q of the filter is not adjustable means that you often end up affecting frequencies you wouldn't like. Versus a parametric equalizer, which um, allows 
allows you to set very narrow filters at very specific frequencies, any frequency you would like to get to, and cut it by just the amount needed. Um, but those are not as maybe intuitive to use as a graphic equalizer, which and and it takes a little more uh, know-how and setting to make them work. But you know what you can see here is comparing parametric EQ on the top to graphic EQ on the bottom, we've cut the same frequencies by the same amount. So, you know, 12 dB of 1K and 6 dB of both 500 and 2K, but with a 10th octave, which is a very narrow filter, um, graphic uh, parametric EQ, you'll see what it does to the frequency response in the middle versus cutting those same three frequencies using a third octave graphic. You've basically sucked all the intelligibility out of your sound system here, which means then you're going to try and turn it up louder to get that back and you're going to run into feedback. So again, equalizers can be a useful tool for feedback reduction, but again, parametric, if it's available, is a better way to go so that you don't um, destroy the intelligibility of the system. And a good question to ask when you're setting these up is not, can you hear me or is it loud enough, but can you understand me? Yes. Can you understand what's being said, not is it loud enough? Now there are, and you've probably heard of, uh, automatic feedback reducers. Um, often you have more the, colorful mis names like of eliminators. Yes, eliminators <laughs> and destroyers and things like that. Well, again, nothing can eliminate feedback completely in a sound system. If you got a live live mic and a live loudspeaker. That's right. So, um, but these devices can help reduce feedback, reduce the likelihood of feedback, but essentially all that they really are is a parametric EQ where the filters are deployed automatically right. by the signal processor. Right. So this device is able to, when it hears feedback, um, figure out where that frequency is and put in a very narrow notch filter at just the right amount of depth to get rid of that feedback. Mm -hmm. So again, it's 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 an it's an automatic equalizer is almost a better term for right. it. But so, again, pretty much for speech applications. Right. Again, because music, you know, again, a, feedback so, might be a musical thing to do. Uh, right? You might be intentionally right. creating feedback. It could be you know a soprano holding a very right. long sustained note. This device isn't going to know the difference right. there. So, but for speech applications, they are predictable. Again, they're not predictive, which means that the, the device has to hear free feedback before it can get rid of it. You mean it doesn't know I'm going to walk in front of a loudspeaker? Nah, unfortunately, it doesn't. Although, I wonder if you could put GPS into one of these. And I have thought about that. <laughs> Uh-oh. He's going for the loudspeaker. Better employ, better deploy some filters. Um, and the speed of engagement is frequency dependent. So uh, typically, lower frequencies, it will take maybe a little longer to deploy right. the filters. Um, and if multiple frequencies start feeding back simultaneously, like the whole system just goes nuts, the device can get confused and may not deploy things effectively. And again, just like with a, with a manual equalizer, there's a limited number of filters and limited filter depth. Um, you know, something like our DFR22 has 16 stereo uh, feedback filters in it. And sometimes people say, gee, that's not enough. Well, if that, those aren't enough filters for you, you have other problems. You better go back and look at PAG. You better go back and look at PAG, right. And as we mentioned, maybe not necessarily so great for musical applications. So really... What it comes down to is if there's not enough gain before feedback, here's the, the list, the order you look at things to try and get more. Number one, move the microphone closer to the talker. I think we've kind of beat that into the ground at this yeah. point, but it's cheap and it's easy and it, and it works, right? So get the microphone as close as possible to the sound source. Then, if you can, move the loudspeaker closer to the listeners, which has the added benefit of getting the loudspeaker further away from the microphone. Or move, which, the, or move the listeners up front of the auditorium closer to the loudspeaker. That's true. Do. That's true. Yep. That will help. And then reduce the number of open microphones, right? Again, I was trying to keep that NOM factor as small as possible. So people could turn the mics on and off themselves physically. There could be a sound engineer that the following a script, mm -hmm. turning microphones on and Which off. you see a lot in theatrical applications, right? right? Is the, the, the sound person is following the script, script and, right. turning on the mics when someone needs Ford to. Or an automatic mixer, yeah. Again, moving the microphone further from the loudspeaker, further from the microphone will help. And then we get to using directional microphones and loudspeakers. Number, so number five. Number five mm -hmm. on the list. So before you automatically jump to, we're getting feedback, we must need to go to a cardioid microphone. Look at all these other things first. Um, again, oftentimes if, if you're using an ear set mic where the microphone is right down at the corner of your mouth, as long as you're not looking for stupid amounts of gain, very regularly when I'm doing presentations, I can walk right in front of the loudspeaker. Right. And there's no feedback because the microphone is so close to my and mouth. Let's go back. We didn't talk about the directional aspect of it, but if an omni microphone works fine at an inch away, then the cardioid is going to give you the same basic output at 1.7 inches away. Not five times, right? but 1.7. Right. 
So you can figure, start with the Omni, multiply by 1.7, and that's where you can put the, the cardio. It's, it's, it's a difference, yes. Is it a huge difference? No. Then you reach for the equalizer, right? So after you've done all these other things, still not quite there, need a couple of more dB, all right, now we can go in and with air, preferably with our parametric leak equalizer reduce system. And realistically, maybe four or five filters. If you're deploying 10 to 16 filters, you have other issues. Right. Definitely. There are no other solutions. Darn physics. <laughs> Always wins. And we put that in there in red and bold and all caps because often, you know, again, when we're assisting customers, we will go through all of these things and you go, nope, can't do that. Nope, can't do that. Nope, can't do that. Nope, can't do that. What else can I do? <laughs> well, Sorry. unfortunately, it's physics, as Michael said. There isn't a whole lot else you can do um, beyond this point. These are the, the the things that you do to try and maximize Lip -sync. For feedback. You can, <laughs> that works too. That works. Turn off the microphone, and hey, feedback does go away. You can if you crank turn it up as loud as you want that way. Unfortunately, that's not usually an acceptable yeah, solution. Yeah. So, so that's that. Um, you might have noticed that there is a uh, a document available for download from within the webinar. We've pre-uploaded it for you, but if you want to come back and get it later, it is available in the downloads area of the SURE website, which goes into more detail on how to calculate PAG, understanding sound system design and feedback using UG math. Um, <laughs> but again, with a scientific calculator, it's actually not hard. A smartphone, though. Or, yeah, well, which is, yeah. yeah, there's usually one on your phone. So there's you all, there's also PAG equations on different websites. You can just put a Google Google search on PAG equation. You'll come mm -hmm. up with fact, websites which have it. Yeah. yeah, in fact, I think there's one linked on our FAQ. Yeah. We go to sure.com yep. slash FAQ search feedback. We have a topic that links to a few online calculators. And there's, there's another, uh, actually, a paper you wanted to Nice oh, yeah. If, if, if you really want to see the research, the first time the PAG equation was actually laid out was an April 1969 uh, AES paper uh, done by the C.P. Boner of Boner Associates out of Austin, Texas. And it basically lays out, it says it's a, this is a rough rule of thumb. So this is not going to get it exactly, but it's certainly a place to start before you you put the pen, you know, put the pen of the paper before you start laying out loudspeakers and cutting holes in ceilings and cutting holes on tables. So, uh, April 1969 AES paper, it's really quite good. It's only four pages long, some funny parts of it as well, but laid it out that, and you know, we've all been living with it since. And it's a very valuable tool. You can also look at sound system design, um, by Chris Foreman from the handbook uh, for sound engineers. Actually the fifth edition is uh, just out. Mine just came in the mail. And so. does it, does it have the, the same Foreman article? In it? Uh, you know, I should actually go yeah. back and look and make sure it's, in. Yeah, it's definitely in the fourth edition. The fifth edition just came out. Usually they don't take things out of that book. They just add yeah. things, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'll take a look. Chris, Chris adds all types of variables to the PAG, but interestingly, you know, it talks about room acoustics and directivity and so forth. They're all negative. <laughs> they all take away from PAG. They don't add to it. Okay, so that's uh, that's what we've got on feedback for today. So uh, I think I'm going to pass back over to Cheryl. Okay, great. Um, we just have a couple of questions, but uh, if you have them, get them in in the next couple of minutes so we can get to them. Uh, first one is says, would it be fair to say that most performance situations where a mic and speaker are involved are where the speakers are placed in front of the performance, facing away from the performer, thus isn't feedback neutralized? Well, that certainly helps. I mean, that is a preferred loudspeaker placement and a stage application is at the front of the stage that the performers are behind the loudspeaker. And it's, it is, but you do see some situations where they, for whatever reason, they've got the speakers behind the performers and that's kind of asking for feedback because the, the loudspeakers are then blowing right into the microphones. But assuming you do have the loudspeakers at the front of the stage, performers are behind it. Yes, that certainly helps. Now, if you turn it up loud enough, you could still get to a point where you're going to get feedback. Performance applications, usually the feedback path is between the stage monitors and the, and the microphone because the stage monitors are there so the performers can hear. So as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, you're trying to make it make the performer's own voice louder at their ear, which is actually the ear ends up being very close to the microphone, which is right. close to your mouth. So it's uh, it, stage loudspeakers are unfortunately a, uh, for monitoring are the worst case scenario and often the most challenging. And the, I, that's I, more in-ear monitors that we see. That's why, yeah, you, you, I guess that maybe we should add that to the webinar. You want to maximize game before feedback for stage performance, go to in-ear monitors and get rid of the loudspeakers on the stage. Then there is no feedback path there, which is certainly helpful. And it's from 
the house right. house well, speakers, which are right. typically further mm-hmm. away. But again, you know, the same rules still apply. I mean, that's why a lot of singers intuitively know that they should eat the microphone mm-hmm. <laughs> is because that's how you get the loudest gain before feedback. Um, and that's what you should always do. And of course, you're going to be utilizing directional microphones on a stage, not usually Omni when it's a loud right. you know, rock band or whatever. Um, but all of those, all of the same rules um, still apply. And usually some equalization ends up being involved too. You know, I've seen unfortunate situations where you want to, the, the, the monitor engineer, you know, EQs the loudspeaker system to within an inch of its life to mm. try and make sure there's never any feedback, but then it kind of sounds like this because you've right. racked out all the intelligibility. So the, the acoustics of the room too, you can get reflections off of glass panels and hard walls and so forth, which can send that signal right back at the microphone. And that can be the feedback path. It doesn't have to be a direct feedback path. It could be a a reflective feedback path. Okay. Next question. How can I think about the relationship between main slash sub ZQ coupled with the individual channel EQ when tuning the room, then eventually EQing the channels during the band application? Sounds like a whole different seminar in equalization. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think what they're may, may what you may be asking is what's the relationship between the two? Or how can you take advantage of both? Um, again, typically, you know, it, it, it kind of depends because you've got so many different sources that have microphones on them, right? And often you can do sort of a general kind of um, you know system EQ, you know, on the on the whole sound system, the whole output of the mix or whatever. Um, to try and capture the frequencies that are going to be most problematic. And then sometimes if you've got um, a roving performer with a wireless mic, uh, you can apply some additional channel EQ just to that particular microphone to try and prevent feedback because in that case they're, they're roaming around so much that the frequencies, you know, may change or could be the frequency of response of the microphone is somewhat peaky and maybe you want to try and flatten out the response of the microphone without affecting the overall sound system you can often apply just some channel eq there um to help with it so i don't know that there's a you know do it this way or do it that way i think it could be a hybrid approach depending on yeah, what you're trying and, to accomplish. you can always do the you know start out with a known sound source pink you know pink noise through the system flatten out using the pink noise and and typically you don't want a flat response anyways but you can start there then at least you have a place to start with that you know is okay i'm flat now and we can work from there uh it's it's a great question it's it's <laughs> there's been papers and papers and papers written on this so there is no there's no easy answer yeah i mean keep Sorry. in mind no matter how much eq you apply whether it's on the channel or on the overall mix the maximum benefit you're going to get i believe is about six to eight db yeah eight db e- on the outside on, on yeah. the outside it's the most you're ever going to get um, which is why, again, we say talking about digital feedback reducers, why 16 filters is more than enough, because if you have to deploy more than that, you're not getting any benefit right. anyway. So if you, you know, if you need to make up 10 dB again, don't try to do with equalization. It's not going to happen. Right. Okay. Next question. At my house of worship, we have super cardioid mics hanging in, hanging in the choir with monitors just above the mics. <laughs> any ideas? Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> 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 Sorry, was that too blunt? Um, we run into this question a lot. Uh, you know, the, the, I mean, the best thing you can do in that situation is <laughs> hope that the choir doesn't need themselves reinforced. Right. They're all standing right next to each other. Hopefully, they are all listening and hearing each other. And then the the, the loudspeakers are only used so they can hear the band or hear the pastor or other sources that they may need to hear. But Again, that's that's the worst possible scenario because the microphones are far from the sound source and end up being close to the loudspeaker, and it's yeah, it's just not you, you can't reinforce a choir. You can't expect this a choir to have the same amount of monitoring level as a solo singer. Actually, I did see it solved once. Honestly, it's it was a it was a church in Oklahoma. They had forty eight singers. They had forty eight. SM58s, each of them three inches away, and a 48 channel mixing board just for that. Mm-hmm. And then they got some pretty loud sound levels, but basically everybody was close to a mic. So you can't do it when the microphones are distanced. The PAG won't, no, you know. They're six feet away in a choir application, right? <laughs> exactly. At least. Yeah. So um, it's, you know, or hey, in ear monitors for everyone. Or in ear monitors for everyone, exactly. And then they blow their heads off. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Um, I have heard the term ringing out the microphone. Where would that fall on the list of things to check for feedback removal? Okay. So ringing, what they're talking about ringing out is um, that's basically another term for applying equalization to minimize feedback. Um, and the reason it's called ringing out is because when a sound system starts to feedback, people have say oh, the system's starting to ring. So what you're intentionally doing is making the system ring or making it feedback, pushing the levels up such that you start hearing feedback and then using EQ to figure out what those frequencies are and get and, and, and that was fifth frequencies. down the list. I think it was right. So yeah, it's the same, <coughs> same as equalization, which is fifth, sixth, I believe below using sixth, a directional yeah. microphone. Yep. So, so again, all those other things first, then EQ. Okay. Next question. My guitar amp and onboard electroacoustic guitar both have a phase switch, which does help remove feedback. How does that factor into all the notch filtering you mentioned? Mm, well, the only reason the phase switch helps is that it, <laughs> it, 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 it's not sending the exact signal, sending the reverse signal back at the microphone. It will, even with phasing, I mean, there was one thought once in a while that if you put all the, micro, all the loudspeakers out of phase, it won't feed back. No, it just feeds back at a different point. <laughs> uh, it feeds back at a different frequency. So I, I don't really have a good way to explain this verbally. <laughs> um, <laughs> integrated system like that that's installed by the manufacturer on the guitar they often know or can predict what frequencies are going to feed back based right. on that particular instrument and electronic design right so they might have figured out that okay well if we do you know invert the phase here that will help at that particular frequency so that works for that instrument for that system but as a general rule of thumb you can't just like flip the polarity and think like oh, i will get rid of my feedback no just, no if, if you if you start flipping polarity on microphones over you're just gonna have a, the world's worst sounding sound system so uh it's it's an interesting question it really doesn't apply well to loudspeakers and sound reinforcement systems okay sorry <laughs> with most systems comprising of directional speakers and microphones how does this affect the fsm in real world use the feedback stability margin. Generally, I think, I mean, that, that, that it's kind of an arbitrary number, but sort of six, six dB is kind of what we just like to say. So again, using, using directional components can give you, again, about four, I think we said about four to six dB of additional yeah, we, gain for feedback. I've been, I've been looking at PAG recently with some of the engineers, and we've determined that if the loudspeaker is properly located in relationship to the null of the microphone, assuming the microphone is directional, uh, you might get 3 dB from that. Maybe with a bi-directional, because it has such a deep null, you might get 4.5 dB. But you can just kind of think about 3 or 4 dB. Or so so it might offset the feedback stability margin, but we, we, we throw that in there just because you never want to operate a system at its peak. Right. So, again, the PAG is not perfect but it's really good for a rule of thumb to let you know if you're even in the ballpark. And then whatever you get from the directional microphones will, or directional loudspeakers will make it better, but it won't be, it won't, still can't overcome what PAG comes up with. That's why we always encourage people to use PAG, even though it assumes omnidirectional components, is because if it won't work, even with all omni components, right. th mathematically on PAG, then you know for sure it's it's not going to work D at directional, all. Directional, right? So, yeah. So, so the directionals are enhancement, but they can't override the basic physics of the PAG equation. Great. All right. I think that about wraps up our questions. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you learned a little bit of something, and we will see you next month.